Hello and welcome to Songs for the Struggling Artist, the blogcast. This is episode 282. Welcome to the blogcast. My name is Emily Rainbow Davis. I am pleased you are here listening. Today's blog is about creativity and business and creativity in business and creativity not in the arts business. Uh, business business is a fun word to say, apparently. Um, so I'm going to read it to you. It is called, Maybe I Should Go Into Business. Creativity is incredibly important to me. That's why I read Jonah Lair's book, Imagine, How Creativity Works, even though he's been disgraced for being a little too creative with his Bob Dylan quotes. Before he got himself disgraced, he made all the podcast rounds, so not much of the book was a particular surprise to me. I've heard the story of the invention of the Swiffer. I know all about Pixar's architecture. I am familiar with 3M's post-it note development. However, the cumulative effect of reading the whole book made me feel like the people who really care about creativity are in business not the arts. Businesses like 3M, Pixar, and Wyden and Kennedy are in the business of innovating, so they do the studies. They run the experiments. They actually value creativity, it would seem. What strikes me the hardest about this is how arts organizations are not particularly interested in creativity and innovation. Arts organizations do not run experiments to see what will make its makers most creative. They're not working hard to innovate. They put their hardest work into seeming stable, secure, unshakable. Theaters, museums, and such are some of the most conservative of businesses. It's a real drag. And ironic that it is the creative arts where creativity is so taken for granted, so devalued, so bottom of the pile of priorities, as to be almost never talked about. Creativity is not a big value in the creative arts. This is why I'm thinking of getting into business. Not any business. I know most businesses don't have the interest in innovation that places like 3M or Google do, but I am ready to sign up for a businessy day job with benefits if I could be valued for my creativity. Maybe it would be great to bring my outsider creative brain to the task of inventing new kinds of tape or a crazy new mop or whatever. I'd love to try and solve some kind of business problem with my theater brain. I'm tired of trying to solve theater problems with my theater brain. No one wants those things solved. I will go where I'm wanted. The thing is, as much as outsider perspectives do stimulate creativity, the way the computer programmer invented the bacon-infused old-fashioned, or the scientists at Innocentive tackle problems outside their fields for prizes, it would be extremely unlikely that I would ever be hired at any of these creativity-loving businesses, except as a receptionist or something. And I know from experience that no one ever asks the receptionist what they think about a creative problem. So even though I might be willing to jump over to business just to be valued for my creativity, it is extremely unlikely that they'd want my brand of creativity. Even innovating businesses are suspicious of willful, rebellious artists. We may not talk about creativity in the arts to our detriment, but creativity is, at least, usually implied. Probably I need to stick with the people who drink the same sort of creativity water. Maybe it's just so common we don't need to talk about it. I'd like to stay in the arts, actually, and just experience more creativity and innovation there. Also, I discovered after I wrote this piece that I'd read this book before, back in 2012, b 
before Jonah Lair's fall from grace. Hilarious. So memorable. No wonder I recognized so much of the material. It occurred to me as I was reading this to you that probably not everyone is as familiar with this story as I would imagine. Um, probably not, right? So so let, I'm backing up a little bit. Jonah Lair is the guy who wrote this book, Imagine. And uh, what happened was he made up a bunch of quotes that are not true. And they're really banal. It's really like, it's like all the stuff he said Bob Dylan said that he didn't say. But it's not like, oh, he made up something really interesting. Like he just made up something dumb. And so his book was pulled from the shelves. You can't buy it anymore. Uh, it, you know, uh, new. You can't buy it new. You can buy it used because he doesn't see those profits. Um, I don't even I, – I doubt it's been pulled from libraries. Maybe it – I don't know. Anyway, uh, he was disgraced. But what's funny is, like, I looked it up to see, like, where – like what happened to him after that. And this man has published two more books since his fall from grace. Since he lied in print, he has been given two additional publishing contracts, was back in the circuit doing the thing. I mean, I, I, don't, I think cancel culture does not exist because this guy was canceled. And uh, he has been uncanceled. I mean, I don't think he was like, he's, he hasn't been, you know, as popular as he was prior to this, um, what do we call this, a scandal? But, um, yeah, anyway, that's all kind of beside the point. But, but, but uh, it does explain maybe how I forgot that I read this book before. And the, the way I realized I read this book before was that uh, I was, like, looking for something in my Goodreads account. And I noticed that I had already, like, added it to my list of books that I'd read. And I did this in 2012 or 2011, maybe even. I don't know. But it, I'd marked it in 2012. Um, and there's nothing about, like, you know, I didn't write a review. Usually I, I try to write a review of stuff there, but I didn't on this one. Um, so I'm assuming that means that I had not, that the controversy had not yet, you know, come forth. But I, I, I guess I totally forgot that I had actually read the book. I maybe got distracted by the scandal. Anyway, it's just, it's funny. It's a good thing I do keep track of these things on Goodreads, I suppose, because, you know, there may be other books that I've completely forgotten that I've read. Um, I, it, I mean, in one way, it's kind of a benefit to be able to just, like, read things as if I've never read them before, you know, like I can completely forget the whole twist of a plot in a novel. I can for, I just forget, you know, all kinds of details. So it's like uh, I can just read stuff all over again, which is what I did here. <laughs> uh, anyway, business is fun to say. So, you know, I feel like I had a different kind of response to it this time. Um, so I thought at first that I might try and do the Flight of the Concord song, uh, called It's Business Time, or maybe it's just called Business Time. Um, I tried to learn it and it is really fun to play. So I, I was like, oh, maybe I should keep working on it. But it's, um, it's just like, it's a comedy song. And the chorus I could do, no problem. It's just like the text of it requires a, a certain, I think it may require maleness is what I think it might require. I just didn't see a way to like do it. So what I did instead <laughs> was to learn uh, taking care of business. Like, what? Yes, I did. I learned taking care of business, which is a very silly song. It's it's very silly. I mean, 
wow, you know? Wow. Uh, And it's very likely that you, like me, have never really paid much attention to what's going on in the Taking Care of Business song. Because, you know, what happens in it? Oh, they take care of business every day. Uh, But (laughs) it is, first of all, it's just four chords, and they basically cycle through the whole time. Second, uh, the the verses are basically like a critique of commuting to an office job and also sort of reveling in doing nothing by being self-employed. As a self-employed person, I find that hilarious. Um, so I'm going to play that for you in just a second. Uh, you'll you'll hear that I have added a little patter in the middle, uh, which was popular with a couple of people on a previous song. So I figured, what the heck? This I, I wasn't gonna play a like ukulele solo, so so I did a little a little self employment patter, sort of from the perspective of the band. You know, the bands, what it would be like to be a band now, doing self employment. Yeah, so settle in for that in just a minute. Meanwhile, thank you so much for listening. If you like the podcast, please tell someone about it. Share it on the social medias, like, review, subscribe, all the things. Uh, If you would like to support it with your dollars, much appreciated. Uh, That is patreon.com slash Emily R. Davis or Kofi or PayPal. All those links are in the show notes. Um, I am in the process now of putting together the zine that I do for my patrons every year. Um, So if you have not yet joined Patreon and you're thinking, oh, gosh, I'd really like to see that zine of 2021. What a great year. I'd love to (laughs) memorialize it somehow. Ah. Um, If you join my Patreon before the end of the year, I'll still send you a zine and all the music that gets... um, Uh, put out here on the podcast. So both of those things are benefits of being a patron. So um, I think that's it. Yeah. So uh, here you go. I give to you a song from the great Bachman Turner Overdrive. Here is Taking Care of Business. that AMA on uh, Reddit, and then I gotta 
promote the thing on, on Twitter. But other than that, oh, and then I guess I better get on Facebook and promote the other thing. Oh, you got to do that cross promotion with the other band. That's important. Take good and we got to make a TikTok video. Oh, I forgot about that. And we got to take the promotional photos ASAP. Are we going to get that on the calendar? Oh, and then we really better make sure that we record that podcast. Taking care of business. 